I mean, many people do that have been popped in the back <laughs> This is your law. Why am I doing it? <laughs> Without you at the point. So we'll start. So we'll start here in a couple of minutes. Um, we are uh, we are unfortunately very pressed for time today. Um, yeah, I'll give. Uh, we're nine fifty-seven, so I'll give one or two more minutes, and then we will uh, we will begin. They only uh, they're only giving me thirty minutes today, and uh, I have way more than that to say. So um, if any of you are curious about what we're going to briefly touch on today, um, you know, I more than encourage you to come uh, come either contact me personally. I'll be here all um, the next the next three days. Uh, I'm happy to discuss any of these details further. Uh, also, you know, you're, I'm always open to people reaching out to me via email or via my Wikipedia user page. And um, yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll provide the details of my contact information at the end. And, um, for those who wish to uh, get a hold of me. Unfortunately, I think this room is probably also a little bit hard to find, as I'm sure many have experienced. Fourth floor, way in the back. So, I imagine we'll have a few people running late. I know there's a number of people who said they're going to be here, but um, there's one more. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sandra State. I'm your session host for the educational talks in Provincial Room 123 at beginning 11. Um, this morning we have James Heinemann. He's going to give the talks on Wikipedia and medicine. And um, I'd like to introduce James Heilman from his Wikipedia page as a Canadian emergency room physician and an advocate for the improvement of Wikipedia health-related content. So I do hope you enjoy this session, and if you need anything, don't hesitate. My name is Sandra, so you can call me Sandy. I'm just here. You just let me know what you need. Um, I think smart devices can be put on um, silent for vibration right now. Uh, thank you. Enjoy yourself. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> OK, so a little bit about myself. I'm a small town emergency room physician. Um, I have some academic affiliations, but I'm a long way from my university. Here's the up in the right upper hand corner of the country of Canada. I live down in the middle of these gorgeous mountains. Um, this here picture here is about 15 kilometers from where I live. It's one of my favorite places to go hiking. Um, but it also means that I'm a long way from academics. I became involved in Wikipedia in 2007, 2008. Um, I was working a night shift and um, my department was quiet. I was looking around the internet and I came across this article that was horrible. It was completely full of edit errors. And then I saw an edit button and I realized that I could fix the internet. And I sort of got hooked and I've been trying to fix the internet ever since. 
So, first question, does the internet matter? Um, and <clears throat> here are you know, a couple of graphs of where people um, in the United States get their <coughs> news. And what we see, uh, this is broken down by age group, we see that in the, um, in the 18 to 30 group, um, you know, starting in 2009, most people got their news from the internet. Same thing, the 30 to 50 group, um, the number of people who get their news from the internet surpass the number who got their, get their news from the television. So for everybody under the age of 50, the internet is the primary source of their news information. And of course, in 20 years, all these numbers will shift such that the news, or the internet is going to be the primary source of information for everyone. So, um, probably one of the reasons why newspapers give us such bad coverage from time to time is they're scared of us. They know where the world is turning to learn about what they're interested in. With respect to healthcare, um, they, they did a survey um, last year here in the United States and they found that the average person in the United States sees their doctor three times a year. That means the average person spends 60 minutes with a medical doctor. But they spend more than 52 hours every year looking at the internet for healthcare information. Um, and Wikipedia is a substantial portion of that time, about 25% of, of time people spend on the internet they spend looking at Wikipedia, um, healthcare information on Wikipedia. So if you're a physician and you want to have the greatest impact on patients, the best way to do it is to fix the internet, as well as seeing patients in person. So, first question, is Wikipedia read by everyone? And, you know, the answer is pretty well yes. Um, we, you know, NG West and I have been collaborating on looking at uh, statistical data around uh, Wikipedia medicine. Um, uh, and we found that Wikipedia's medical content received about 5 billion page views in 2013 for the 160,000 articles that exist across 255 languages of Wikipedia. Medical articles make up about 2 to 3 percent of all page views um, uh, for Wikipedia. So medical articles, as, you know, as a proportion of Wikipedia as a whole, are much more heavily read than your standard Wikipedia article. Um, and so, you know, while medical articles are 0.6% of Wikipedia articles, they get 2 to 3% of, of page views. Half of these page views for English, were for English, and half of these page views were for, um, for other languages. Now, do physicians use Wikipedia? Um, a number of surveys have been done looking at the usage of Wikipedia by healthcare providers. And what we found was that somewhere between 50 and 100 percent of practicing physicians are using Wikipedia in clinical practice. 30 to 70 percent of pharmacists admit to its use, and it's the most frequently used source by junior physicians and medical students, um, besides Google. And of course, as we all know, Google is not an information source; they're a search engine. So, why do medical students turn to Wikipedia? when they have access to the best sources available. And they've asked them, and, and, and the reason they state is they say Wikipedia is easy to access. Wikipedia is relatively easy to understand, and Wikipedia provides the level of content that they're looking for. Um, you know, the difficulty with, with some sources is, you know, you look at up-to-date, you know, it's hard to search, um, you need to enter your password every time you come to it. The same thing with PubMed, the same thing with your university library. There's just all these painfully slow steps. Um, and Wikipedia is just fast. Now, if we compare the viewership of Wikipedia versus the viewership of other major healthcare resources out there, and this is based on, uh, on um, data from a similar web um, among other websites, is we find that um, the visitors to Wikipedia, uh, this is back in 2013, were close to, if not slightly greater than, the readership of National Institute of Health, which is the second most popular medical website in the world. We get more page views than WebMD. We get more page views than the World Health Organization, substantially more page views than the World Health Organization, and up to date, which is a, does similar to what we do, but for a more professional environment. Next question, 
does Wikipedia cover everything? So if one was to take Wikipedia's medical content and one was to print it out on paper, this is what it would look like. Here we have um, a, a person who's six foot tall, standing beside a bookshelf, um, and on this bookshelf, each one of those little blue squares equals a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica. So if we were to print Wikipedia out, and this is without pictures, we would end up with 127 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. So there is a massive amount of medical content. Does Wikipedia have a huge number of editors? And the answer is sort of yes and sort of no. Um, if one looks at Wikipedia generally, one finds um, that, come on, um, one finds that you know, there are 22 million registered accounts um, and that many more edit anonymously. One finds that 80,000 people make more than five contributions a month. 12,000 people contribute more than 100 um, edits a month. And, and all these, of course, are, are volunteers and um, working for free. Now, when it comes to medicine, the numbers are much smaller. Um, you know, we find that there were 224,000 accounts that made edits to medical content in 2013, and they made 1.1 million edits. Um, half of, about half of these were in English, and about half of these were in other languages. But the number of people seriously involved with improving Wikipedia's medical content is incredibly small. You know, we look at the readership, and then we look at the core editing community, and there is such a stark contrast. In 2013, there was 274 editors who made more than 250 edits in the entire year, and that's for all languages. Um, you know, about half of these were for about half of these editors were in English. So you're looking at a core community of 120 editors in English, writing for a readership that views this content two and a half billion times. The other concerning trend is we've looked at how our editor numbers have changed over time. And what we see here, we see a graph looking at the number of people who have made um, more than one edit to um, the English Wikipedia. And what we see is, uh, it should actually be 10 edits. What we see is that from 2008 to 2013, the number of contributors has fallen significantly um, each and every year, and, we, and you know, we've looked at the, we look at these graphs, you know, with cutoffs of how many people have made 100 edits, how many people have made um, uh, 250 edits, and we see a downward trend in all groups. So it's 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 quite concerning, you know. And, and for those of us who edit medical content extensively, we see this within our editor communities. We see that our numbers are have been shrinking over the last few years. So who are our editors? Well, you know, if you watch Fox News, you might think, well, that, you know, um, Wikipedia's medical content is written by plumbers somewhere in the, in the southwest of the United States. That is not true, um, as is most things on Fox News. Um, <clears throat> we surveyed our top contributors. Uh, so we sent surveys out to, to those who made more than 250 edits in 2013. Um, about half of them responded. And what we found is we found that half of people, half of the core editing community of Wikipedia are healthcare professionals. We found that half, slightly more than half, have either a master's, PhD, or MD. Um, and an additional 33% have a Bachelor of Science. Um, so, well, anyone can edit Wikipedia, not anyone does. And you know, just as a comparison, these numbers are very, very different than um, that. Those of the general population. Um, <clears throat> we also asked about gender. You know, gender gap is is, is an interesting question. Uh, we found that eighty percent of our editors are male, percent of our editors are female, and an additional ten percent would either rather not say or describe their gender as other. <clears throat> Many of those who are professionals um, uh, on Wikipedia, or are professional, um, professionals in real life, are involved with categorizing medical articles, on formatting references, on, or, or uh, you can come on in, um, are involved with um, uh, correcting grammar. Uh, some members of the lay public, though, have created some incredible content on Wikipedia. So, you know, one, one father of a gentleman, or one father of a child who has epilepsy, wrote her article on the ketogenic diet. 
for epilepsy, and it's one of Wiki Project Medicine's featured articles. And it's interesting, you know, I was looking around the internet and I found this great article on the ketogenic diet um, published in the Canadian Journal of, of Neurology by a couple of uh, experts at the Mayo Clinic. And I said, so I sent this article to, to Colin, who is, um, who, is, who is the editor who wrote this. And he was reading through it and he said, I've written part of this. Um, and these experts from the Mayo Clinic had decided to borrow liberally without attribution or proper paraphrasing from Wikipedia. Um, so it's not just high school students who are um, writing. So um, why do people edit Wikipedia? Um, a survey was done about a year or two ago, and they found four key factors for why people come in and improve Wikipedia's medical content. One, of course, uh, as one would imagine, is that, that you know, these people feel positively about Wikipedia. They feel they have a responsibility to help um, um, others. They see Wikipedia as a great way to learn um, uh, the content material. And finally, these people find Wikipedia editing fun. So the question is, how do we find more of these people? Um, and then, you know, how do we make Wikipedia more fun? How do we build the editing community? And these are questions we haven't solved yet. A common question I get from um, academics is, is Wikipedia peer reviewed? Um, and the answer is sort of yes and sort of no. Um, as many of you are, are, are aware, you know, Wikipedia has a featured article process, a good article process, uh, which is Wikipedia's internal peer review process. Um, medicine has about 58 featured articles, about 170 good articles. So what this means, it means that less than 1% of all Wikipedia's medical content in English has passed a semi-formal peer review process. So some people have argued the reason why we have less editors is that the work is done. And this, in my opinion, shows that no, the work is not done. You know, there's a huge amount of improvements that Wikipedia still requires. There's a huge amount of work um, still to be done. <clears throat> to, to increase the reliability, one other thing we're looking at is we're working on um, um, a formal peer review uh, in collaboration with journals, and I'll, I'll speak about that slightly more in a bit. So, what, you know, uh, I'm a member of Wiki Project Med Foundation. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're a not-for-profit uh, that's basically a group of Wikipedians uh, trying to build collaborations with, with other organizations that share our ideals um, uh, to improve uh, open source content um, uh, and Wikipedia, but open source content generally. Um, we're working on a bunch of collaborations, uh, which I'm going to briefly run through here. One of our collaborations is with the Coffee Collaboration. Uh, the Cochrane Collaboration is, is one of the foremost, if not the foremost, evidence-based research organization in the world. Uh, they have 31,000 members. They're from 120 um, countries. And they work on creating high-quality um, syntheses of the medical literature. And um, I'm not sure Sidney Poor is here yet. He's sitting right up here in the, the fourth or fifth row. She is um, our new Wikipedia resident at the Cochrane Collaboration. So Wikipedia, the community is complicated. Um, and so the Cochrane Collaboration has hired Sydney Ford, who's a very experienced Wikipedia, a former nurse, and she is giving advice to the Cochrane Collaboration on how Wikipedia works and how to interact with, uh, with Wikipedia. She's also working on developing uh, a weekly mailing list that will, that will push um, uh, the research that, that the Cochrane does out to Wikipedia editors like myself, who are interested in adding more high quality literature, uh, and this is an initial way to uh, to keep stuff up to date. Cochrane has invited us to speak at their, we, we spoke at Cochrane's colloquium, which is sort of like our meeting here, but for Cochraneites. Um, uh, we spoke, uh, Jake Orlowitz and myself spoke at in Quebec last year. Sydney is going to India to speak this year. Uh, and you know, this is a great opportunity for the Cochrane Collaboration. Well, they do, you know, the Cochrane Collaboration does, does excellent research. Um, you know, Wikipedia is a way that they get, uh, you know, their research out to the public. If you spend two or three years working on a systematic review and meta-analysis, and it just sits on PubMed, unread, or it sits in some dusty drawer, it doesn't have the impact that it deserves. 
And additionally, this is an excellent opportunity for Wikipedia, as you know, this will help us improve our um, our content. Another collaboration we're working on is with an organization called Cancer Research UK here in the United Kingdom. Um, they are the largest cancer charity. Um, they've also recently hired a Wikipedia in residence, John Brian. John, is John here today? I see Henry uh, from uh, Cancer Research UK here. Um, they're working with us at Wiki Project Medicine to improve our cancer-related content. Um, and we're currently working on improving brain, brain, pancreatic, and esophageal cancer. An additional thing that they've done is they've uh, begun donating images under a license that we at Wikipedia can, can use. Another collaboration is with the National Institute of Health. Um, we've been working with the National Institute of Health now for, for about three years. Um, we're working on a number of collaborations. Uh, you know, we're assisting them in running edit-a-thons at the National Institute of Health. Um, one, one department within the NIH has given their employees time, a couple hours every few weeks, to get together, while being paid by the NIH, to work on Wikipedia. Um, currently being run as a pilot project. We're additionally collaborating on definitions of diseases. So they're working with us to craft simple definitions of diseases, and then they're using Wikipedia as a reference on the National Institute of Health page. So here's an article, for example, of um, the NIH referencing Wikipedia. Um, this is the article, uh, so they have an article on venous thromb thromboembolism uh, on PubMed Health, and they have the definition, and then they have a little attribution to Wikipedia. The biggest project that I'm working on is um, something called Health Information for All. Um, this is the one I feel most passionate about. Um, it's a, a collaboration between Translators Without Borders, an NGO founded in 1993, which does humanitarian translations in other languages, Wiki Project Medicine, um, and Wikipedians across many, many languages. What we're working on is we're working on creating a base set of medical topics that we feel should exist in every language of the world. Um, we're gradually working to improve them into a professional standard in English while working the best we can to keep the language as simple as possible. We're then translating this content into as many other languages as possible with all the Wikimedia markup in place. And then we integrate these translations back into the Wikipedia in that language. Um, and then finally, the other exciting aspect of this project is Wikimedia Zero, um, which we're of course not leading, but we're very excited about as it gets easy and, and inexpensive access um, for everyone um, via collaboration with cell phones. We're working on two tracks of articles as part of this project. We're working on full articles. Um, our goal is to bring you know, 10 full articles to either good article status or feature article status. These articles are typically 2,500 to 10,000 words. Um, but they're very in-depth, and you know, so they're more suitable for mid to large languages. They're of course suitable for English, but uh, they're not suitable for for, for smaller languages. Um, so we're working on also shorter articles. These articles are three to four paragraphs. Um, uh, we basically go through and we improve the leads, so the top section of the English article, and then we're just translating the top section, which is the overview of the condition in question. And you know, our goal is to do a thousand of these articles. Um, they're more applicable to small to, to middle-sized languages. Because of course, you know, many languages of the world don't have the rich vocabulary for science and medicine that English does. This is an example of one of the articles, um, on, uh, one of the short articles that we're translating. What we notice is that you know there's four paragraphs of text. Um, you know, this is, this is a, it's, it's well referenced. Um, and make a brief overview of rabies, uh, which is still come on in, uh, which is still um, an issue in, in many parts of the world. And of course, is uh, death from rabies is entirely preventable with knowledge. Why do we need this? Um, a statement by Health Information for All 2015 states that a major factor in people's death in the developing world is poor access to healthcare information. Um, for example, 8 of 10 caregivers do not know the key symptoms of pneumonia, which is very easily treatable much of the time with antibiotics. Um, diarrhea is one of the top killers 
in the world for children under the age of five. One and a half million people die every year from, from diarrhea. Part of the reason is that many mothers believe that when their child has nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, they shouldn't give their child anything to eat or drink. Um, I even see mothers like this in Canada, but they of course thankfully have you know, hospitals they can visit, and we have the opportunity to educate them. Many of these opportunities don't exist in other countries. More than 60% of Africans said that a friend or family member could have been saved if they would have had language and would have had information in their own language. You know, one of the concerns is in you know countries like like Tanzania, um, you know, people go to see the medical doctor, and the medical doctor has studied in English, mostly speaks English, and they don't understand what the medical doctor is saying. So instead, they go and they see the healthcare provider who speaks their language, and that, of course, is the witch doctor. And they ask the witch doctor, what causes malaria? And the witch doctor says, witches. And that's not good for people's health. So we see Wikipedia as a viable way to address this knowledge gap. The issue, of course, is right now, little healthcare content exists in many languages. This is partly because the majority of medical research, medical publications are English. So the only real solution is, you know, um, to take the content written in English and translate it back into other languages. So, you know, I work with many people. In fact, um, uh, I was speaking in, in Italy a couple of months ago about our work. And I asked this audience um, um, who didn't speak much English, what language do you publish in? And I said, do you publish in English? And all of them put up their hands. And I said, do you publish in, 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 in Italian? And all the hands disappeared. So this is, this is, these are the top academics in Italy, and they're not publishing in their own language. Um, so we have to. Translation is the only solution uh, to this, the only short-term solution to this issue. So a couple of graphs looking at, looking at language differences um, uh, across the internet. What we find is for those of us, all of, all of us here are exceedingly lucky. Um, uh, we speak English. Uh, and that means that 60% of the internet is there for us. An additional 10%, um, an additional 10 key European languages make up another 30% of the internet. Japanese, Chinese, Korean make up another 8%. Um, uh, and we see, you know, Arabic, Hindi, and Bengali. You know, these languages have hundreds of millions of people. There's basically none of the internet available to them. Um, and that applies to you know those who speak the other 4,985 languages of the world. Now, if one looks at the world by language, one sees something completely different. Six percent of the world speaks English. Ten or twenty percent of the world or so speaks these ten important European languages. Um, Bengali, Hindi make up um, in Arabic make up twelve percent of the world, and nearly half the world speaks one of the other very large number of languages. Wikipedia is much better than the internet generally. We're about halfway between um, um, the world population and the internet. There's still a lot of work to do. The next important step is bridging the digital last mile. Those in the developing world have poor access to computers, they have poor access to the internet, um, but there's a potential, and, you know, and one of the problems um, is that cell phones while they're widespread, data is expensive. So one of the amazing things the Wikimedia Foundation is working on is they're convincing cell phone companies to allow Wikipedia access without data charges. This means that um, uh, for the first time, many people are getting access to this incredible library of knowledge. Um, and so far agreements have been signed that are gonna benefit 350 million people in Africa, the Middle <coughs> East, um, Asia, and Eastern Europe. Um, I was climbing in uh, Tanzania um, a number of years ago. I was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, and uh, you know, we, I arrived in Arusha, um, showed up in my hotel, asked him to call me a guy. My guy showed up, didn't really speak English. He was in his mid 50s. We climbed to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, and he pulled out his cell phone. And he texted his wife, and you know, to let her let her know when we would be back for supper. So cell phones are everywhere. Cell phone coverage is amazing. 
Um, and this is such an opportunity for those who you know, are working on these sorts of efforts. What are some of our successes um, with this project? Currently, we're working in about 100 languages. We're hoping to expand to all languages. We've translated more than 4 million words. Um, some languages have improved content for, specifically for their audience. So for example, I wrote an article on HIV AIDS in English. Uh, it was translated from English to Persian. Um, um, Persian has then gone on and they've localized that content to their language. You know, they've added a section on HIV AIDS in Iran. Um, and that's what we, we, we love to see. That article, along with 23 other articles, have got, become good articles or featured articles in their respective languages. So, so you know, the content we're creating is being recognized by the Wikimedia communities in those languages being some of the best content uh, available. Some of the difficulties, our translators do not like Wikimedia markup. Um, we're not sure how to get around that, but what we've done is we've color-coded the markup and we said, don't touch any text in this color. Um, and it works fairly well. Another issue is that technical words do not exist in some languages, and you know, we're working on simplifying our content in English, which we need to do anyway, um, but we especially need to do for translation. Simplification, however, is important. It is difficult, it's very important, but it's very difficult. Um, and we, of course, need more people to help us with simplifying English Wikipedia's medical content. Um, a few other interesting initiatives that have taken place. Um, Wikipedia recently has turned into textbooks. Um, a company called Boundless.com, um, I think it is, which started in 2011. Um, I was looking around the internet one day, you know, looking for references, and I came across this collection of textbooks, and I realized I had written them. Um, and I was like, wow, this is so cool. Um, and this company, basically they take content from Wikipedia, they, they, they edit it, they, they, they shorten it, um, they make it appropriate for a first or second year university student. And, you know, there's about 10, 000, there's about 10 standard textbooks in biology, and you can select which biology textbook you're using, and this company automatically rearranges all the page numbers so the Wikipedia textbook matches the textbook you're using in your class. So when your prof says, turn to page 250, the textbook, the text that you see on page 250 covers the same content as your textbook that your class, the rest of your class is using that costs $150, $180. And these textbooks are either free or $20, depending on um, what you want associated with it. The company claims that these textbooks are used by 2,000 plus um, US colleges and by more than 3 million uh, students, which is 15% of all US students. Um, one class, in, at least in the, in the southern United States, is using this textbook as their primary textbook. <coughs> so this is the textbook everybody in the class is using, and we have written it. It's um, a little scary. Um, the competitors, so the other textbook companies, sued Boundless.com. Uh, they claim that they put so much work in deciding what content they put on what page and that putting the same content on the same page as the publishers is copyright infringement. <laughs> Thankfully, um, well, the US has some issues with, with law generally, um, boundless ones, sort of. I'll skip through a couple of others. Um, with respect to, uh, another issue we're working on is, is open medicine. Um, uh, this, we're, we're collaborating with this journal. Um, what we're doing is we're bringing articles on Wikipedia to very high quality. We're submitting the, the articles to the journal for formal peer review. So, we've, uh, you know, myself and an internist wrote the article on dengue fever. Um, it's become a featured article on Wikipedia. We took that article, we, we submitted it to, to the, the journal Open Medicine. Uh, they submitted it for formal peer review. We dealt with the formal peer review, and it's been accepted for publication. Um, so, the first Wikipedia article, hopefully in a couple of weeks, will appear on PubMed. Uh, under, of course, a CCBYA uh, essay license and um, under the author's real, real names. So the Wikipedians who wrote this, off, this article will have their name on an academic paper. Other journals are also interested. Um, another uh, initiative we're working on is we're collaborating with the University of California, San Francisco. Um, they have offered, uh, they're offering electives in Wikipedia to medical students in their fourth year. 
So this, you know, when you're in fourth year of medical school, you do different electives and different subjects. Uh, the students have the opportunity to spend four weeks working just on Wikipedia. Um, UCSF is one of the most prestigious universities, medical schools in the world, um, and uh, you know it's just a pilot at this point. Um, you know, there's a couple of issues that we're still dealing with, uh, but it's uh, it's exciting. Another initiative is a uh, student club of medical students. It was started by medical students at Mount Sinai, uh, and these these are groups of medical students who are getting together to to edit Wikipedia um, in their free time and to learn medicine at the same time. So, um, I think of. Um, um, so is Wikipedia reliable um, is an interesting question. Um, Wikipedia is about verifiability rather than about truth. Um, we love references. Um, uh, for medical content, we specifically want high quality references. As if Wikipedia is based on the best available content, it means we will have the best available encyclopedia. Um, we very highly reference our medical content. So we reference basically every sentence of our article, we reference much more densely than textbooks, we reference much more densely than journal articles, and that's of course because we don't know who our authors are, we have no way to verify they're experts, so we want our content to stand entirely upon the references provided. Um, one of the uh, positive things is we look at how the number of references for Wikipedia's medical content has changed over time, and we have seen a substantial increase in the number of references to medical content from 2009 to 2013, We've additionally found that the number of references for you know, particularly high quality um, content, such as the Cochran collaboration, have increased even greater than the average reference. Um, and we have found that the most commonly used journals are the most well-respected journals uh, within medicine. You know, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, BMJ, Gamma, <coughs> Science, and Cochrane were our top used medical sources, which is wonderful to see. So we're also looking at additional research. Um, I'm working with, with, uh, with a doc at the U of T to um, look at other ways of, of assessing the quality of the medical content. One thing we're doing is we're looking at, at testing um, medical students. One group of medical students is going to have Wikipedia. One group of medical students is going to have uh, up to date. One group of medical students is going to have nothing. They're going to write a standardized exam, and we'll see whether Wikipedia makes them smarter or stupider than um, up to date or nothing. So it's, it's this will give us a good indication of is Wikipedia making people smarter. Um, I'll skip this. It's a copy and paste detection thing that we're working on, and uh, is, uh, to save time and allow the next speaker her due, I will end there. I'll be here all day if anyone wants to um, talk to me further. Yes, yes, so, so um, you come on up and I'll, 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 just, I'll have a few questions while, while you're getting uh, going. So um, there's, there's a group of us who are medical Wikipedians here today. Um, uh, we're meeting after the, the next talk. Uh, we invite anybody who's interested in medicine to, to, to stay here and hang out with us. Jake, do we have a room? Now it's here. Okay, so so we're gonna be we're gonna be speak we're just gonna be like chatting about about Wikipedia and medicine from uh, eleven o'clock until people get bored, which means uh, I'll be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Um, genetic variants. There's things like uh, Snipedia, which is a completely separate Wikipedia. Are you linking with them at all? Wikipedia is that? Um, Snippedia, of editing the significance of genetic variants. Yes, so so I'm I'm only dealing with clinical medicine. Um, um, I'm not sure your answer to that question. Uh, there is a wiki project genetics, and there is a wiki project um, uh, bio molecular chemistry. Um, yes, so they would be better people to ask. I'm not sure if anybody knows the answer to that question, but. I'm not sure is the answer. Yes? Do you work with the cross or are there any organizations? So, you know, uh, we're working with translators of borders. 
which, uh, which is sort of an aid organization. We're working with Cancer Research UK, which is um, uh, definitely an aid organization. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're just starting collaboration with the Khan Academy. Um, with, they're launching medicine and, and we're going to be working with the Khan Academy. Um, but we're open to more collaborations. We're working just a tiny bit with, with, with MSF, but not in an official manner, just official form at this point in time. Thanks so much to James who's doing an awesome job. Yeah, yeah, we can. to come closer because I want it to be some kind of intimate uh, if possible so please don't be shy there's plenty of room here at the, at the beginning of the classroom I think it is. Um, very excited to be here. Um, my name is Shanine Eggenstein. I'm from Israel and hopefully James has just presented uh, a very serious and important problem and hopefully what I'm going to present to you is a tiny part of and hopefully a solution. So <coughs> let's begin. Uh, first of all, before I do that, um, let's see a show of hands. How many of you are here in Wikimania for the first time? Oh, yay! Very nice. How many are Wikipedians? How many of you are running outreach projects? Well done. Great. OK. Um, so a mixed audience, just the way I like it. So let me begin at the beginning. Let's see what we have, what I've um, made for you today. And I've divided my, my session into three main parts. I want to, first of all, um, introduce the course that um, I had at Sackler and how it came to be, then of course the results, which I'm sure everyone is really curious to know about, and conclusions and what I see for the future. Um, can everyone hear me at the back? Great. <coughs> so uh, let's begin at the beginning. Why don't we? It was exactly a year ago um, that I was sitting at my office, at the curriculum development office at Sackler School of Medicine at the Tel Aviv University in Israel, um, minding my own business. And someone came, a faculty member, a professor, came in to the office and she said, I really, I don't know what to do, maybe you have some kind of idea. I'm looking for elective courses for our medical students, our Israel medical students. And uh, I don't know what to do. I don't have any, and maybe you can give me something. So I, being a Wikimedia and Wikipedia for a few time, for, for a few years now, I said, well, why don't you have a Wikipedia course? And just like that, three in the air, didn't think it would mean anything. I was thinking I was planting a seed, like I was doing many times before when talking to labs or educational institutions, and Actually, she caught the, the coin that I tossed in here. Uh, and she said to me a week later, well, why don't you do that? So the first step was to basically create from scratch a syllabus and present it to the committee affairs at Sackler, which needed to deliberate and see if it's something that Sackler would want to be engaged in. And this is the place to stop for a second and say that if I haven't presented myself properly yet, my name is Jenny, I'm 36, I'm a Wikipedian and Wikimedian, and like many of you in the audience today, I was uh, attending Wikimania in Haifa, 2011 it was for the first time, sitting in the audience, listening about all kinds of very cool educational and glam collaborations, and felt I really had to be part of it. I joined right then and there and became quite active. And I've been doing a lot of glam and a lot of educational stuff. Um, <clears throat> so I've been giving many lectures about Wikipedia. So this didn't came out of nothing. Uh, I was already working and collaborating and looking for ways to expand our collaborations. And so 
as I said at the beginning here, sometimes it's just about being at the right place at the right time and not being afraid to be bored. So July, she came to the office. I tossed the idea. August, she said to me, why don't you do it? I had to, to create a syllabus. And this is, again, a good place to say that we've had many kinds of collaborations in the academic world and with all sorts of institutions. We have uh, lectures allowing their students to write articles to Wikipedia as part of their um, chores in the semester. But usually it was just being invited to a separate course. What was unique about this course is that this was the first time we got to create the whole course dedicated wholly to Wikipedia for a whole semester and for it being an elective course that people actually get credit for taking. So this was the first time it was happening in Israel, as far as I know, in the world. So we are very proud um, of that. And we did. I immediately called a few friends and talked a lot about what should be in such a course and created the syllabus. We handed it into the committee, which accepted it. And of course, it accepted it a week before the semester began. And which brought me to October uh, when the course began. So what were the general goals of this course? Basically to make people, as James said, write content that is medically related by med students and basically teach them how to contribute to Wikipedia and Wikipedia projects, not only Wikipedia but other projects as well, and just have some kind of experiment to see uh, what can be achieved in a whole session, in a whole semester, actually. Because again, we used to run working out uh, uh, all kinds of workshops and editing, uh, editathons and all kinds of, uh, we were giving many, many workshops like this, but not for a full semester. So it was very interesting for me and for the rest of our community to see what would be the results of such collaboration. So these were the results, and I created a syllabus that I divided into many three parts. We had three introductory sessions, and then eight core sessions, and three summarizing sessions where um, they were peer-reviewed, and the students presented what, what they did throughout the semester. A total of 40 weekly sessions. And this was how I created the grading for the course, if uh, anyone is uh, curious. It was, it's important to see that there are really two main things that they had to do throughout the semester. Each student had to basically uh, expand a stub, and I'll show you examples in a second. And then the second main thing that they had to do was write a completely uh, new article in Wikipedia. So each student basically had to contribute two articles, and I basically graded anything else that I wanted them to do. So if I wanted them to, to fill out evaluations, I graded that. If I had small chores that I wanted them to do throughout the semester, I graded that as well. So there's some kind of incentive. Because this is an elective course, and at least in Israel, um, this is something that is not compulsory for students. So I had to make sure that I engage them as much as I can and uh, make them do what I want them to do on time. So that was a challenge, uh, and that's one of the ways that I uh, overcome it. And a few things that I wanted, uh, or that I considered, while doing um, the, the thinking about the course and how I wanted it to look. So first of all, uh, it was clear to me that the session had to be mandatory, which again is really not the way regular elective courses run in Israel. So that was one thing. We needed a laptop because we actually wanted students to come to class and um, try editing in small groups and have some kind of interactive um, session with, with um, guides from the Hebrew um, Wikipedia community. So that was one thing. Um, <clears throat> you see here that I've been using two, basically, platforms. One was Moodle, because the university uses it, so it was a good tool for me um, to do all the exercises, to have some kind of 
safe place for the students to practice it before I throw them into the very deep water that is Wikipedia. Um, so that was one thing. The other thing that I was, I was using is the education extension. How many of the Wikipedians here know about it? A few of you. Um, let's see if I can maybe open it up just to, so you can see how it actually looks. Oh, it doesn't work. That's so good. Okay. Technical issues every time. Yes. Okay, so I'll show you to those who are interested maybe at the end. Uh, but basically, I was using the education extension on Wikipedia, which basically allows me to, um, to manage a group of people and see who's working on which article and assign people to check certain articles. It's really comfortable. I like it, and I used this tool as well. And maybe the most important thing for me was thinking about this course was how the hell am I going to invite as many people as I can from the Hebrew uh, Wikipedia community to join me. So that was really key because it's a huge thing that happened and I needed all the help that I could get. And I was very lucky and uh, very humbled to see how many people uh, jumped in to help. Many of the very, um, let's say, key, key Wikimedians and Wikipedians from our community came in, gave, some of them gave um, guest lectures, some of them uh, came to class to help um, assisting students while they were exercising, and of course, many of them assisted online. So we were very lucky in that sense. And after all this preparation, uh, we went to the journey and, uh, and <coughs> just did it. Um, you see a small owl because I felt we were just like a baby trying a new thing. So that's why. And you can see here a few, a few of my guest lecturers in the course who are Wikipedians from the Hebrew community. Some of them are here. Um, the one on the, on the um, picture below, she's a doctor who is actually a Sackler uh, graduate. So it was, and, and a Wikipedian. So I was very lucky to have someone like that who actually knows uh, the students and knows what we're going through. And she came to lecture. Uh, she was, of course, one of their favorite uh, guest lecturers. Okay, so I'm sure you're all curious as to the results of this fabulous course of mine. So, a bit of statistics, because we love numbers, right? Um, so 65 students signed in for my course. I actually wanted 40 at the beginning, but I, I was having a hard time saying no. Um, and when students wanted to sign in, because it was the first time, I didn't want anyone who wanted to attend the course not being able to do so. Uh, and so gradually the number grew. Um, hopefully next year I'm going to be smarter about that and stronger about saying no and I'll talk about it a bit at, at the end. Um, so 62 completed the course, which is amazing because there is a really huge drop uh, from signing in to people who actually complete courses, so that was amazing. And we have 25 women in, in class, which I'm very proud of. Uh, as you heard James say, uh, we have many, uh, many men contributing in terms of medical-related content, but very few women. So hopefully, I'm helping adjust them, the numbers just a bit. Um, and what the class included is basically a mixture of students. And you have to, to realize these are first-year students, uh, which is important to understand because at Sackler, the electives that they take is only on first year. So I had no, um, no other option than to get these students who are basically thrown into water for the first time in their lives into medical school and taking my course. It had some advantages, um, but that was the reality of this course. So 37 of them were med students, um, 22 dentistry students, and I had a few, uh, a few more people um, coming in um, which is really lucky. One uh, was a PhD student who heard about the course. She, she read about it actually in the Israeli newspaper and decided she had to try it. And I'm so grateful that I had the sense to say, yes, of course, in Walberg, because she ended up writing brilliant articles and loved the course, and that was amazing to have her. Another um, unexpected thing was this academic stuff um, a woman who's a professor at the dentistry, um, uh, dentistry school, 
she came to my intro lecture, which I opened up to the whole faculty at the beginning of the semester, and decided to stay. She had a really hard time, but she overcame all the obstacles and became an avid Wikipedia, which is great. And uh, another cool thing that happened was that one of the, because we collaborated, this was a new thing, and we were very lucky to collaborate with the um, uh, social media and uh, um, relations um, of the of, of uh, the whole university. They helped us uh, publicize a bit the discourse, and one of the administrative staff came to join the course, which is amazing because she studied how to um, edit Wikipedia, and now she's contributing content, which is unrelated to medicine, but cool anyway. She's contributing stuff about the university to Wikipedia, so that was an added bonus. And you can see one more thing interesting is that I had three, a mixture of three mother tongues in class. Many of my students were Arabic um, in, in mother tongue and three Russians and only 30 um, students who actually spoke Hebrew as a mother tongue and that was crucial. It was, it was um, an interesting challenge. So formal results, as I said, this is quite amazing. I'm kind of proud of about that. We had 64 stubs um, written throughout the semester and 64 new articles, a total of 128 new articles in Hebrew Wikipedia relating to medical stuff. And this is unparalleled in, in terms of any other collaborations that we had in such a short time. Um, the amount of con contribution was amazing. So we're really happy about these numbers. And a few examples because I wanted you to see. This is actually a category that I created. It's in Hebrew. I know none of you can read it. But you can see all the list of uh, cool names in a language, in a weird language you don't know. Um, these are, th this is a category I created in, in Hebrew Wikipedia for the stubs that were created so we can follow it easily. Um, and we have fairly really important things and basic things, as Jane said, uh, many of the very basic things that everyone is looking for weren't available. So we helped correct the, the situation just a bit. And this is what a stub looked like. So basically nothing, a few lines, that's it. And I couldn't really show you the whole thing because it's fairly long, but you can see at the beginning that there's um, um, some kind of uh, introduction and then a menu that shows you there's a lot of stuff going down. Um, another example, this one was done, this is um, metastasis, um, which is something many people look for. This was written by, by that PhD student who came to course, so that was cool. And this is how it looks, looked later on. And this is a list of all the new articles written, one of them uh, mitral valve replacement, something that again many people look for, so it's available now. We also had a few unexpected results in this course, um, and I think the thing that, that's really important for me was a wide acceptance and support from the Hebrew community, uh, Hebrew Wikipedia community. I couldn't possibly have done this without them. It's just uh, consider the amount of work of. Um, checking 128 articles and see that everything is okay. Of course, we had a few glitches and things that, that needed work, but all in all, uh, it was because of the support of the community that I was able to pull this off. And a few things that um, students were really touched by this course, and a few ARBs students told me that they are now contributing to Arabic Wikipedia, which was a cool bonus, contributing content to Wikicommons, which was a cool uh, thing that happened, uh, and a few students came to me to say, listen, this is a great course, we really want to help make it stay for following years, and we, we would like to help you um, in the following years, so I'm really excited about that. Um, already told you about the contributors that were unexpected in my course, and we also had media coverage that I didn't think would happen, but happened anyway, including radio interviews and coverage in uh, Israeli and non-Israeli um, newspapers. So that was cool, and of course, the Wikimedia blog. Um, and this, which I would have never found about uh, unless some student of mine wrote about, 
And I created an evaluation point because it was important for me to measure as many things as possible throughout this course. I had 90, um, eight, almost 90% 90 of, of students answering the evaluation forms, which is amazing because usually, again, email students don't fulfill uh, evaluation forms. And they really like the course generally. Um, here are some, I'm going to skip because the, the presentation will probably be available. So if you're really curious what they say exactly, uh, you can read later. And I want to come to the end and talk about conclusions just a bit. So I think these are the, the main two things that I have to conclude is, first of all, it wasn't perfect. And it's important for me to, to, say, uh, to say it here out loud. It was a great success, this course, but it wasn't perfect, which makes sense. And I have to tell myself repeatedly, um, it's OK. Labor brains are, are natural. Uh, it's, it's OK to, to learn from your mistake and correct it and do better next time. And practice makes perfect. So a few things that I would definitely change administratively is, first of all, um, as I said at the beginning, shrinking the class. Uh, having less students means I will be able to maybe follow them more closely, and it would be easier for me to, to manage it. Um, and moving into the second semester, because again, it would give them at least one semester of medical uh, studies, so that would be good. Um, and I think the last point is important as well. I'll try to do it, although it's very tricky. Um, a, few, a few of the biggest challenges we have in terms of content came from students who were really passionate but didn't speak Hebrew as a mother tongue. And that meant that the content they contributed was not in a good level, um, the good enough level, and it demanded a lot of work afterwards. And unfortunately, I would really love, as I told and I did my best to support um, the Arabic students who came to class because it was very important for me um, personally. But uh, in terms of manpower, it's just impossible to do so much work for each and every uh, article. So I'm going to allow them to come, but I think I'm, I'll have to somehow manage it a bit better. So these are our administrative changes. A few content and academic changes is, um, as I said, I didn't talk about, about it much, but I come from the Curriculum Development Office, and one of the things that we do is think of the best way to teach today in a world that knowledge is accessible and students are literally not coming to class. Are there any educators in the audience? Yeah, so I'm sure you've heard um, phrases like the classroom is dead, and of course everyone is talking about this new classroom, yeah? Trying to find new ways and new, um, both um, <clears throat> integrative and um, Again, better ways to, to reach out to students, to make them uh, engaged in what they study. And the best way to do it is simply not the way I'm lecturing now to you. You're passive listeners now, which is not what we want. We want students to be engaged. And that's why we created the exercises in small group sessions. So for next time, which is going to happen because uh, the course got proved, which is really great. Uh, the academic affairs, when the course ended, I didn't say that, but when the course ended, uh, the academic affairs uh, at SAPR deliberated and saw the results um, to, to consider if they want to continue with it, and they decided to do. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, the course is going to continue next year, hopefully, if everything goes well. And so one of the things that uh, I'll have to do is perfect the exercises in Moodle and make sessions for exercising full. Because what we did is have a session and have a small exercise at the end, and that created a lot of mess. So maybe separate sessions for just exercising would be better. And I'm just wrapping up. What's, what's in the future? Or what do I see next? So I'm not clairvoyant, obviously. But um, I think I would love to see, this is the ideal future as I see it, I would love to see Wikimed established in the academic world, not only in Atsakler, but also in other med schools in Israel and 
worldwide. And I think that this course really showed that it could be any course. It doesn't have to be medical related. Medical related course is great, but there is no, nothing to, no reason not to do it in other faculties as well. So I would love to see basically elective courses for every BA, in every faculty, in every university. So that's how I want the future to look like. And yeah, it's good Q&A time. I'm here uh, throughout the three days. Um, if anyone has a question, I'm happy to answer that. Don't be shy. Yes. Thank you for such an interesting video. Are there any students who spoke English that you could translate and keep into English? No, I didn't have English speakers. Can you please the question? What was it? I'm Susan Greer, and were there any students who spoke English so that they could participate in the course and then translate the Hebrew into English? So Susan asked if there were any native English speakers in, in my class so they could take Hebrew um, articles and try, translate them into English. And the answer, the short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is that we actually used many of my students translated from English Wikipedia or um, work with existing um, English Wikipedia articles as, as a base to what they did. Some of them came to me and said, wow, this is a brilliant article. And some said, well, the English version is not really good, so I'm going to make it better in Hebrew. So James doesn't know it yet, but I'm really hoping to collaborate next year and work about translations more closely, and maybe having him as part of the session as well. I didn't mention it, but it was very important for me to um, to, to show the students that what they're doing is not only contributing to Hebrew Wikipedia, but actually making them part of a global movement. So I invited um, Daniel Mitchell, who is not here today, but he's also part of the uh, Wikimed project in English Wikipedia, and he lectured, he was one of my guest lecturers, so hopefully James will agree. No pressure, James. <laughs> so hopefully James will agree to do it next year, that would be awesome if he does. Um, any other questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, since the, the courses are over, uh, are the articles being uh, modificated again? The, the what? I'm sorry. Uh, since the, the, the course is over, mm -hmm. uh, are the articles being modificated again um, by other people? Or yes, definitely. Um, what's your name? Uh, Anna. Anna is asking if the, the articles that have been written are being um, continued to be edited. That's a really good question. And the answer, the, the very, I'm very happy to say that yes. The fact that these articles now exist um, means that more people in our small community uh, go to the course and help edit, add more data. Uh, I didn't have time to say that we were trying to collaborate with some, some institutions who are writing articles in a private, uh, in a private project, but, but um, these are doctors who are creating content on a, on a media wiki platform. So we would basically, in the long run, would love them to contribute some of their uh, already existing articles <coughs> to, to Wikipedia as a base, at least, for our students to, to write articles and to add to them. Hope I answered. Any, yeah? So the question, um, would it be feasible for you to have um, an Arabic patient speaker working alongside you? So I would have Arabic loved that. And actually, I've, I've tried to pull many of my uh, personal strings to get someone uh, from Arabic Wikipedia to come and contribute and help. Uh, I would love that. But it's not possible. It's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to find people who can do that in Israel. And um, I'm really counting on my own students to hopefully um, next year, as I told you before, one of the very cool things that happened is that student came, students, a bunch of them, came to me and said, well, we want the course to continue and we're willing to, um, to contribute and to help you make it better for next year. So one of the things that I'm really hoping to do is creating a tutoring program so that students that took the course this year can maybe help me tutor the next 
the next class, the next generation. And so it wouldn't be only I came, I took the course, and bye-bye, but there would be some kind of continuation, some kind of sustainability, if you will. Um, and above all, sustainability, it was cool to see, we were curious to see what will happen half a year later after the course. So a bunch of students, really a small group of them, are still editing, um, which is which is nice. We would have loved it if more of them would. Um, but again, it takes energy, time to reach out to them, to, to see. But I can tell you from talks in the hall that I know the course impacted them beyond the course because students came to me and saying, um, we talked about this course in a completely other medical related conference and we really want to teach other medical professionals to edit Wikipedia as well. So they're looking and doing stuff beyond the course already, without me, which is, for me, the best thing that could have happened. So thank you all for listening and being such a cool audience. Um, I'm here if you have any more questions. Okay, so, so we're going to have a medical meeting for everybody who's interested. Um, um, John has said he's found a better room for us to meet in. Uh, we're going to have the conservatory terrace. The conservatory Opp terrace. Opposite the library, they've got coffee there and lots of space. So obviously, you have before the coffee break. And, and John has additionally said he's going to lead yep. those who don't know where it is in that direction. Which is so we can just gather those who want to hang up. We'll, we'll hang on here for two minutes, and then and then John will will guide us in that direction. <laughs>